Right, so for as much as our politicians have been abject failures in seeing things from anything other than Israel's perspective in this recent conflict, our mainstream media has been no better. The constant asking of that first question to pro-Palestine advocates being, do you condemn Hamas? Being a blatant attempt to frame the argument rather than actually be able to stand up and speak on behalf of innocent Palestinians who are being caught up in this genocide that Israel is conducting on the basis of trying to rescue hostages, they tell us. Yet by bombing indiscriminately on the premise that Hamas hides behind human shields, they are showing no regard for Palestinians, nor actually for the hostages they purport to be trying to rescue, because unless their view of liberating them comprises of liberating them from existence, I can't see how anyone can say a meaningful rescue attempt of any sort has been tried by Israel. Yesterday in London saw the British public's view on this situation and their biggest show of solidarity with the Palestinian people yet though, as for the third weekend in a row people took to the streets up and down the country, half a million alone in London. But if you happen to be watching the BBC to be informed on what happened there yesterday, you might have been given a very different picture of what actually happened. Right, so yesterday once again demonstrations happened up and down the country from London to Manchester to Glasgow as people marched in solidarity with Palestine in flagrant opposition to the narratives being set by our establishment party leaders. But the BBC, those ever so loyal servants to establishment interests, stuff full of Tories at the very top as it is, a very different message was being sent out. And I'm going to focus on the London marches here because, frankly, I have to. London-centric BBC only focusing on that particular march in any detail, the detail being to play it down and discredit it rather than show it for what it actually was. This morning, the breakfast bulletin on this march in London went like this. More than a thousand metropolitan police officers were deployed across the capital to keep order as people protested against attacks on Gaza three weeks after Hamas launched a surprise attack on Israel, killing more than 1,400 people and taking 229 hostages. Within the crowds were chants of, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, seen by Israel and most Jewish communities as a threat to its existence and by the Home Secretary Suella Braverman as anti-Semitic. Pro-Palestine supporters say it is a call for freedom. No action was taken by the police over the chanting. The report here was the reporter here was Laura Trant, who had been introduced by the studio anchor after saying tens of thousands of people marked in London. I have to say I've seldom heard more dishonest reporting than this particular one. Half a million people downplayed to just tens of thousands. We've seen the footage. We've seen the crowd sizes. We've heard from people who were there about the scale of this demonstration. How dare you minimise that? I also had to check this Laura Trant woman out, had, that she hadn't come up from the sort of thing, sort of background as Guido Fawkes or some other batshit right-wing hack rag. Such was the overt bias and comically bad sourcing of what she was saying in her report too. It was offensive in so many ways. But this was BBC 101 for those of us who don't watch the Blasted Channel anymore for precisely this reason. First off, more important than the march itself, more important than the reasons for it, they had to begin with a reminder of the police presence. There's police there because, you know, all oh, these pro-Palestine demonstrators, they're troublemakers. It's bound to kick off. Better fill the place up with the fuss. We need to tell people the police were there keeping things safe. Well, funnily enough, the Met Police have their own Twitter account and, well, they were keeping people updated with their responses overseeing this demo. Half a million people marching, or tens of thousands if you take the BBC line. How many arrests then? The day after the BBC feel that that's the start point, that's where they have to begin their coverage. The police presence should be the main focus. How many arrests were there then? Well, there were nine. Nine people were arrested. Nine people. Seven for public order offences and two for assaulting police officers. Out of half a million people? Well, that's pretty good going, isn't it? What about the next point then? People demonstrating for Gaza after Hamas launched a surprise attack on Israel. Now, there's no defence of Hamas here. What they did was to pray. But the narrative here is that all these people, well, they're, they're clearly all wrongans, all half a million of them, because they're demonstrating for Gaza after Israel was attacked. How dare they? How offensive. To date, 6,000 Gazans are dead with a further 20,000 wounded. But Israel is the BBC message, though. Well, Israel allegedly were informed by Egypt that these attacks were coming. So not so much of a surprise, was it? Sure, the deaths there were completely avoidable, but it's Israel that hold the keys to the kingdom and have it within their power to end this by letting Gazans be free, what they're calling for. Instead of being two million people interred in the biggest concentration camp on the planet, as the Gaza Strip is. 
Israel holds all the cards here and allegedly are funding Hamas to give them the excuse to commit genocide. How about you investigate that then, BBC? No, silence there, eh? 229 hostages taken. How about you ask Israeli strike forces how airstrikes and bombardments of churches and mosques when Hamas are apparently hiding in tunnels is freeing hostages? Rescuing them alive? The actions of Israel right now imply they do not actually give the slightest bit of a shit about rescuing these people alive. How can they when they don't know exactly where they are, but they're levelling the place anyway? How about the chanting that war? The BBC team to have a right bee in its bonnet about the chanting. They're chanting from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. And apparently this is a threat to Israeli existence, and most Jews fear for their lives when they hear it, not to mention Sorella Braverman regarding it as anti-Semitic. Well, they had to shoehorn in that play again, didn't they? The phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is exactly what it says on the tin. From the River Jordan, which forms the eastern border of Israel and the West Bank, exactly why the West Bank is called the West Bank, they're on the West Bank of the River Jordan, to the sea, the Mediterranean, forming the western border of Israel and the thin bit of coastline that the Gaza Strip has. It simply means from east to west, Palestine will be free. Why should they not be? Is that not the two-state solution? The only people opposed to that phrase are people opposed to the two-state solution then. Suella Bradman thinks it's anti-Semitic. Well, she's married to a Jewish chap. She might think she has skin in the game. The BBC might see her as someone worthy of reference as a result of that happy coincidence. But when she's the sort of person who dreams of deporting people, wants to x-ray kids to make sure they are kids, thinks sticking migrants on a Legionella-riddled prison barge is humane, who are the BBC kidding when they hold her up as an example of how they think we should all be regarding the prospect of freedom for Palestinians? Are they having a laugh? As for most Jewish people fearing the prospect, most Jewish people, I'm sure, do not associate themselves with the conduct of Israel. Indeed, a great many Jewish people were marching yesterday in solidarity with Palestine. So once more, this is the BBC conflating Judaism with Zionism, because the Zionists can go and do one when they're on the side of a country right now committing genocide in the name of their right to exist, committing genocide against people who just want their own right to exist. How dare the BBC treat us the public with such absolute contempt and take us for being utter fools. Sure, there will be Jewish people interviewed to make this point for the BBC. There will always be some who will help their narratives, claim they are in fear. In fact, I'll depart from the BBC slightly here, because they aren't alone in this. Picking up this very point was ITV News, interviewing of all people Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, who will, of course, and went said, and said the Jewish people are one single large family to Paul Brand. What's that? Very nice way of putting it, Rabbi Mervis, but families also happen to disagree with each other. And when he also went on to say Jewish people are now more fearful than at any time since World War II, well, he's just blatantly running cover for Israel at this point, and not Judaism. Jewish people joined this march, joined the marches across the world. The truth is before their eyes, they aren't all Zionists. I'd wager most of them aren't, and you also don't need to be Jewish to even be a Zionist. God knows Keir Starmer proves that point. Though no doubt many would be considered by some to be the wrong type of Jew. But this aspect of the BBC interview, this argument amidst all the destruction on both sides, helps nobody at all. It is an argument that Israel have the right to do what they are doing now and have been doing for 75 years since the Nakba, and the Palestinians do not have that same right in return, that right to exist. I don't accept that. I will never accept that, and I'll condemn anyone making that assertion and hold them to account. All people have a right to life. When one side here, though, considers the other to not be human, but to be beasts and animals, as the former UN ambassador for Israel literally said of the Palestinian people the other day on TV, such is their emboldenment that global media and politicians the world over will stand by them, regardless of what they say, they no longer even hide it. Don't watch the BBC. Do join a demonstration for Palestine, though. Do keep yourself informed by turning away from mainstream media sources and embrace the alternatives, because it is those alternatives via social media at this moment in time coming together to expose the truth of this horrific situation going on, this genocide that is caused, causing Israel in its own atrocity commitments such a headache now. They've been exposed. They're still being exposed. And so most of the mainstream media when their narratives fall so far short of what passes for even basic journalism and integrity now. Thanks for watching. Hope you found this video useful. Please share and like and subscribe. If you did, more content out daily. Please do leave a comment below and join in the conversation on this as well. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where even calling for a ceasefire is met by stonewalled silence from our political leaders. And what happens? 
we see Gaza on fire and the blood of so many innocents on their hands as we've seen in recent days. Well, I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer's position on ceasefires is that he won't back one, apparently, until the United States back one. And with Joe Biden lining up more aid to Israel on the basis of preserving the U.S.'s ability to have a foothold in the Middle East, which is the only real reason the U.S. backs Israel, that's not likely to come anytime soon. It shouldn't be for other world leaders to lead ours, though. That's not leadership, is it? And Starmer is coming for particular attack on that issue, not least from within his own front bench, 13 of whom have now publicly spoken out in favour of a ceasefire at time of writing. Starmer has his loyalists still, though, even on this subject of a ceasefire. And when you consider MP for Hove, Peter Kyle is a former aid worker. It makes his input this morning versus Victoria Derbyshire all the more concerning. Right, so no call for a ceasefire is forthcoming from Labour still, as Keir Starmer adamantly refuses to shift his pro-Zionist resolute backing of Israel to pretty much do as they like, despite dissent coming not only from his backbenches, but even his front benchers now as well. He still hasn't sacked anyone at time of writing for that, so he's certainly getting undermined over this right now, and deservedly so, but that could change. Nevertheless, being a Sunday, there were media rounds to be done. Certainly awkward questions to answer, and facing Victoria Derbyshire this week, please do change the name of the show at this point. Laura Koonsberg, ever coming back, is going to feel like such a letdown now. Was Labour's Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, Peter Kyle. Derbyshire put to him that, the Israeli Defence Force have said that civilian deaths in this conflict are inevitable in order to eliminate Hamas. Do you accept that? Now the answer to any normal person would be, no. Why are Israel killing civilians? I thought they were trying to rescue hostages. It's a funny way of trying to do that. How can you get the hostages out alive? To which you ought to have answered your own question. But Kyle, being a Starmerite, tried to weasel his way out of this. He couldn't just say yes or no. But he played a card in his answer that really ought to have implied he knows a damn sight better than what he's actually saying. He came back with, I accept that when there is war, there is civilian casualties. And as someone who was an aid worker, I know what that looks like in practice. And believe me, it's barbaric. It is unfair. And that is why we should work with everything we have got to try and end this conflict and have in our mind that the long-term two-state solution, which is the only way of delivering long-term stability, not just to Israel and the dignity the Palestinian people need, but also to the whole region of the globe as well. What we're seeing now is desperately unstable, it is unwise, and yes, innocent civilians are dying when they should not be. That's not a yes or no answer though, is it, Peter? That's a lot of waffle. But he played that card, the aid worker card. And indeed he was an aid worker for some 10 years. He worked in Eastern Europe during the Balkans War. So he knows what war zones are like. He's seen the atrocity, the loss of life, the injury, the situation as it is on the ground. And not as it comes to us, safe in our homes, all warm and safe and cosy, second or third hand, as it does through the news, with whatever slant any given news outlet might put on that. You would imagine, therefore, he knows the value of a bloody ceasefire. Just keep that in mind as we go on a bit. Victoria Derbyshire continued, though, she put to him, Do you accept that more innocent civilians are going to die in pursuit of eliminating Hamas, which is Israel's aim? Kyle returned to that with, for as long as there is war, there will be civilian casualties, and that is desperately, desperately hurtful, and it is desperately sad. But Derbyshire cut him off at this point. She had what she wanted, and she followed up with the obvious but no less relevant question of, well, shouldn't you be calling for a ceasefire? Go on then, Mr. Aid Worker. You know that a ceasefire brings a halt to the killings, or should. You can never guarantee Israel will abide by it, but that wasn't Kyle's response, because it isn't Starmer's position, is it? He came back with, we could de-escalate really quickly if Hamas would just release the hostages. That would be the thing, the single biggest thing that could change the dynamic in the region. Why aren't they? Because they are bound by no international law. Nobody is calling for them to be bound by international law. They seized 200 plus hostages, two of which are British citizens. And if they release those hostages now, then that could give us the opportunity for a diplomatic way forward that could protect civilians. That is the sort of thing that could be done. That's the sort of thing we should be working towards. And then we can get back to the table and start thinking about the long term solutions because we can't return to the status quo. The status quo got us where we are. And I think Israel would accept that as well. Not once did the word ceasefire cross his lips. Did you notice that? He dodged the question entirely, saying de-escalation is the way that it, it is all on Hamas. Now, Hamas took those hostages. They killed a lot of innocent Israelis too. That is condemnable, absolutely 
No argument there. Shouldn't be an argument there from anyone. However, Israel have been bombarding Gaza with no real ideas as to where these hostages are. They tell us Hamas hide behind civilian infrastructure. So if you're bombing churches and hospitals and mosques, how can you be sure the hostages aren't there then? Hamas are in tunnels, we're told too. Well, you're bombing them as well. What if the hostages are there too? It's all well and good saying Hamas could return the hostages, but given the Israeli assault on Gaza, how can we even be sure the hostages are even still alive by their hand? Return them, absolutely, I agree. But what if Hamas can't now, or at least can't return them all? Besides, if we're going to talk about hostages, what about the ones Israel are holding? They're called foreign nationals in our news though, aren't they? And they're in Gaza and they can't get out either. They won't be allowed out. Arguably the best known of these right now are the in-laws to Scottish First Minister Hamza Yusuf. If they can't get out and they obviously want to leave, are they not being held against their will too? Are they not therefore hostages under the strictest term of the, of the word, as the dictionary definition? Are they not also facing death and destruction as a result of the ongoing military action? A ceasefire will end the hostilities now. Get people around the table. Now, get negotiators negotiating the release of those Hamas hostages if they are still alive. And obviously Israel can let those foreign nationals go. Kyle knows this, yet he's sycophantically stuck to Starmer's narrative anyway. As a former aid worker, he will know that it is impossible to deliver aid or assistance whilst under bombardment, whilst Israel rains down fire on the areas those hostages may well be being held in. Kyle complains that Hamas are not being held to international law. Well, oddly enough, terrorists don't tend to take a lot of notice of any laws, do they? But equally, Israel is as bad on that score. They're an occupying power, so they are in a violation of international law as well, are they not? They have targeted civilian infrastructure like the Al Ali Baptist Hospital. They have, whilst I've been writing this, issued a warning that they intend to bomb the Al Quds Hospital next. They've issued an evacuation order to them. And again, the same problem there exists as there was before. You cannot evacuate so many sick and injured people that fast. And healthcare infrastructure is protected under international law too. So what the hell do Israel think they're doing with sending out this evacuation order in which case? All the denials about hitting that first hospital, remember those, wasn't so long ago, just the other week, the claims that it was Hamas. And now they just don't seem to care if they're seen to be blatantly violating international law themselves. Because they figure political patsies like Peter Kyle, like his boss Keir Starmer, like Rishi Sunak and Macron, Biden and all the rest, not to mention the media in all these countries, will keep on providing cover and cast a blind eye to it all and dumb us all down. Well, we see you. We're seeing it on social media and we're not putting up with it. We need an urgent, immediate, meaningful ceasefire that isn't getting vetoed or blocked or talked down. And we need politicians with the balls to say it, not cowards like we're seemingly stuck with. Ceasefire now. Say it loudly, folks. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Please have your say on this in the comments below and be part of the conversation too. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation. The attempt the IDF made to absolve themselves of the bombing of that Al Ali Baptist Hospital, just to prove my point and put into context the threats that they're making to the Al Quds Hospital now. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so for all of those Labour figures that have spoken in favour of a ceasefire now, from various metro mayors to MPs, even shadow cabinet ministers now, now including even the shadow secretary of state for justice. There's an irony. Keir Starmer has thus far only suspended one MP from the party. And of course, as you might have guessed, it was a left, lefty member of the socialist campaign group that got suspended. Even now, when Starmer is on his backside over his pathetic position that promotes anything but peace, he can't help but blatantly and factionally attack those left-wingers remaining in his party. The moment he sniffs an opportunity to do so. But what makes this one even more ridiculous is that the MP in question, Andy MacDonald, has been suspended over something that he never said. Right, so what's the crack then, Damo? What did Andy MacDonald say and what is it that he's accused of saying that didn't? Well, we're back to that phrase again, that summer calling anti-Semitic, the summer calling hate speech, the phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Andy MacDonald stands accused of saying it, yet actually he didn't. But even if he had, it's not like there's anything wrong like the pro-Israel lobbyists keep making it out that there is. What is so scary about that phrase? What is so racist about it anyway? Nothing. It simply means from the River Jordan in the east 
to the Mediterranean in the West, Palestine will be free. Let's face it, they aren't free. If you watch me regularly, I've done enough content on this over the last few weeks that I doubt nobody disputes the fact these people in Gaza and in the West Bank are very much not free, and they are Palestine. The only people who could possibly be frightened by that phrase are those who would keep those people oppressed, who would keep them imprisoned in the world's largest concentration camp that is the Gaza Strip. To be against that phrase is to be against basic rights of freedom. So if you are against that phrase, if you are saying it is wrong, or it is racist, or it is a message of terror, then I have nothing but the utmost contempt for you. What a foul individual you must be. And I count so many of our own politicians amongst that. Keir Starmer, the obvious one. The likes of Peter Mandelson, just this morning, who dared to compare on GMB, Good Morning Britain, that the fight against Hamas was exactly like the fight against the IRA. And that peace was only achieved in Northern Ireland because the IRA were defeated. No. People got around the table. The Good Friday Agreement came into being. How dare you compare these two situations? Especially when you were elbows deep in Blair's administration at the time. And you damn well no different, you hollow husk of a man. GMB should be rinsed for even having him on. Why the heck do we care what the mate of a child sex trafficker has to say unless he's being asked just what was your involvement with Jeffrey Epstein? Anyway, I've digressed. Andy McDowell, if you aren't familiar with the chap, he's generally one of the more quietly spoken, loyal members of the Labour left. He was the last former Corbyn front bencher to finally leave the front bench under Keir Starmer's regime. He stuck it out in the name of unity, but also to keep ideals such as social justice and notably promoting peace on the party agenda for as long as he could. Finally resigning in 2021, when Starmer ordered him to give a speech to trade unionists, I believe it was, basically you turning on Starmer's commitment for a proper living wage. Andy refused to do Starmer's dirty work for him and returned to the back benches. Principal guy, good guy, decent fella, a rarity in the Labour Party now. Promoting peace is especially relevant if you can cast your mind back to those now long since cast away 10 leadership pledges to Keir Starmer's, where pledge number four to promote peace and human rights read No more illegal wars, introduce a prevention of military intervention act and put human rights at the heart of foreign policy. Review all UK arms sales and make us a force for international peace and justice. It only takes a cursory look at what Starmer has said about Israel to know this was a crock of shit, but he never meant a word of it. And now Andy MacDonald has been suspended for allegedly saying at the pro-Palestine demo in London on Saturday that Starmer, of course, didn't want any of his lot attending, but which a great many members and elected officials had chosen to ignore for allegedly saying, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Nothing wrong with that if that was what he said, except that he didn't. He actually said... We won't rest until all people, Israelis and Palestinians, between the river and the sea, can live in peaceful liberty. Starmer jumped and acted before he knew the facts. The McDonald said this was reported in the Murdoch Times, who later issued a correction. But not before Starmer reacted to suspend and then probably wondered if Murdoch would let him write another column in the scum about it afterwards. Oh, he's sure to be happy with me, he must have thought. No such correction from Starmer has been forthcoming, unfortunately, though. How predictable. MacDonald himself has issued a statement, though, saying, I am saddened to have received the news from the opposition chief whip that I have been placed under precautionary suspension for a period of three months, which is reviewable pending an investigation by the Labour Party. Throughout the past two days, there has been a number of misrepresentations of my words in the media. These have furthered baseless and extremely harmful accusations against me, which I feel obliged to respond to now in order to avoid any more errors in the press. In my speech on Saturday, I said the following, until all people, Israelis and Palestinians, between the river and the sea, can live a peaceful liberty. These words should not be construed in any other way than they were intended, namely as a heartfelt plea for an end to the killings in Israel, Gaza and the occupied West Bank, and for all the people in the region to live in freedom without the threat of violence. I will be happy to explain these views to the investigation when it convenes, and trust that the whip will be restored. In the meantime, for the sake of humanity, I hope and pray that we see an end to the war in Gaza as steps are taken towards lasting peace. Suspending Andy MacDonald over this is not just deeply offensive, it's dangerous too. It's him today for saying something similar. It only takes another right-wing smear merchant to claim one thing and Starmer acts before he has the facts. He's shown that that's how he works. And even after a correction was issued by his favourite right-wing media baron's horrid paper, the suspension stands. And it stands for three months... Go ahead, vote Labour, put Starmer in power. It'll be your right to share McDonald's sentiment there that'll be stripped from you next.
The Labour Muslim Network have called this out. You wonder how much influence they'd have too under a future Starmer government. But still, they came out backing Andy MacDonald, saying, The suspension of the Labour whip to Andy MacDonald MP today is both obscene and deeply offensive. The fundamental right to live in peace with liberty and self-determination is one which should be applied to all peoples. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that those who have made this decision do not see Palestinian and Muslim life as deserving of this fundamental principle. And they're right. How else can you read it? We need far more Andy McDonald's and far fewer Keir Starmer's as a result. Solidarity to Andy. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do also have your say in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation with Diane Abbott, who is... He's suspended for far longer than Andy McDonald appears to be destined to be. His adamant starver is arranging matters to force her out. And will that be the reality of Andy McDonald's fate, do you wonder? It does make you think. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starr has given a speech today at Chatham House intended to clarify his position and head off further dissent and resignations within his party over the resolute stance of many that a ceasefire is needed now and should be called for now, and that Keir Starmer is wrong for not having done this already, and in fact has completely resisted the idea. Starmer's position up until now has been to utterly reject the notion of a ceasefire, to ignore those who are refusing to adopt his position in this matter. When you consider that includes not just his own MPs and Labour members, along with councillors up and down the country, but the Scottish Labour leader, the London Mayor, West Yorkshire Mayor, Manchester Metro Mayor and more have all come out against Starmer's narrative. The party is splitting as he resolutely stands by Israel in this matter as he does in all their matters and this speech offered no sign that this is going to change. He is destroying Labour with his dedication to apparently destroying more lives in the Middle East. Right so Starmer giving a speech given he's the human form of sleeping tablets is rarely something to look forward to and voluntarily watch but I've propped my eyeballs open with cocktail sticks on your behalf to see it through. But in all seriousness, this was a speech coming after days of social media silence from Sir Kid Starver on the very subject he was being most silent on, knowing that his position is wrecking the party. But it's his party. He always tells us that, doesn't he? It's his party now, so he'll do what he wants. If you don't like it, there's the door. That was his attitude a few months ago. It's still his attitude now. Right, so Keir Starmer's speech, it was never one that was going to come out on the side of Palestinians, and in that he didn't want to disappoint. You weren't allowed to take a Palestinian flag to Labour conference, even before October 7th, of course. You can get suspended for saying from the river to the sea, and of course, there's the Israel lobby and their donors who funded his leadership campaign and who he owes now. It makes the start of the speech all the more notable, since he acknowledged the atrocities that had been conducted and the carnage left behind, the bodies dead children and he acknowledges them on both sides so we can actually see the whole picture he spoke of misinformation well he no he acted on that to suspend one of his own mps andy mcdonald well he went on to talk about the 7th of october after that where the biggest slaughter of jews since the holocaust happened in israel those are his words biggest slaughter of jews since the holocaust committed by hamas but according to starmer that's why they were killed israelis were killed because they were jews and not because they were in any way the overseers of a concentration camp. You bring religion into this to hide behind. You do know that although Judaism is the main religion in Israel, it isn't the only one, right? Were Hamas intentionally avoiding the Muslim Israelis or the Christian ones? You do know large swathes of Jewish people worldwide are very much on the side of the Palestinian civilians in this against what Israel are doing to them. What Starmer did here was entirely delegitimize the Palestinian struggle by painting it as not a story of liberation to free themselves from the river to the sea, but that they just hate Jews and want to kill them. How fucking dare you? He was only getting started, though. He spoke of the hostages, including two Brits taken by Hamas. Of course they should be returned. The question should be, why were the Brits not allowed to leave like all other foreign nationals still trapped in Gaza? Are they not hostages too, by default? How about the 1,500 or so hostages Israel have taken from the West Bank? No mention of them. Instead, he states that this is terrorism on a scale few countries have ever experienced. I can name one. It's called Palestine. It's been going on for 75 years now and ongoing, aided and abetted by narratives like yours, Keith, saying that this is what must drive your response to this event. In which case, you can kind of get a flavour for the fact there's no call for a ceasefire on the way here. He even had the nerve to talk of innocent Palestinians and talk of their lack of food and water and the fact they are having to drink contaminated filth. But then you... 
backed Israel turning the taps off, didn't you? No apology for that, then, since or now. I genuinely couldn't find the words to adequately describe how much I despise this man, Keir Starmer, at this point. He even had the temerity to say that his approach from the very beginning had been to address both tragedies of the attacks on Israel and the humanitarian disaster in Gaza that he himself had backed, but of course has since flat out denied ever saying. We heard you. So why not call for a ceasefire then? Let's get around to that bit, shall we? He said, and I quote, While I understand calls for a ceasefire at this stage, I do not believe that it is the correct position now for two reasons. One, because a ceasefire always freezes any conflict in the state in which it currently lies. And as we speak, that would leave Hamas with the infrastructure and the capability to carry out the sort of attack we saw on October 7th. Attacks that are still ongoing. Hostages should be released, still held. Hamas will be emboldened and start preparing for future violence immediately. And it is this context which explains my second reason, which is that our current calls for pauses in the fighting for clear and specific humanitarian purposes, and which must start immediately, is right in practice as well as principle. As if you have principles. Okay, so let me get this straight. You won't back a ceasefire because it leaves things where they are. In other words, you have no intention of backing negotiation or talks, which is what ultimately leads to peace. That is what happens during a ceasefire. What do you think people do during a ceasefire? Sit around a campfire and drink tea? Cook marshmallows over an open fire? Do you think they're called for the fun of it? Oh, we've killed enough people this week. Let's take the weekend off. Is that your thinking? Of course, you had to bring on the humanitarian pause narrative too. Well, what do you think happens during a ceasefire? Again, I'll come back to it. Aid can get into innocents caught in the crossfire. Here's the difference between a ceasefire and your humanitarian pause, though, or should I say Joe Biden's humanitarian pause that you're just backing. In a ceasefire, food and water can get in and get to those that need it. Under a humanitarian pause, food and water gets to those who need it. Before they get targeted, the aid is then lost along with yet more lives. My God, do I have nothing but contempt for this absolute idiot who conned his way into becoming leader of the Labour Party. What an absolute fool. He understands absolutely nothing and is unable to listen to others because he thinks himself better than them. Save for those on the same side as Israel, of course, referencing the United States and the European Union, who are just as much on Israel's side of this conflict as Starmer is. Also, and a rather weird thing for him to say, which is why I mention it, according to Starmer, the colour of peace is grey. Nothing is black and white in conflict is where he was trying to come from and it made me think surely coming from you that ought to be the colour of peace is beige but then peace isn't what he's after if it was he would call for a ceasefire he has emphatically stated that that is not something he is going to do regardless of the damage it is currently doing and still doing to his own party there were questions after he was asked in one question if as a human rights lawyer he felt Israel were acting within the rules of international law to which he said it's not something for politicians to answer Actually, it is. If they aren't, they should be condemned. As a lawyer, you ought to be able to be quite specific on why. But that you can't or won't shows the sort of lawyer you were and the sort of politician you are. Wretched on both counts. He reckons it'll take weeks or months to ascertain whether they might have or not broken international law. But we know they literally turned the water of power off because you backed them in doing that. You know that was a human rights violation. That's why you backtracked and denied you ever said it, rather than apologise for it. But why stop there? Palestinians getting hammered by airstrikes from one of the most sophisticated and powerful militaries on the planet, who are also occupying Palestinian land, which is against international law. And they've built settlements and seized property there, which is against international law. They've had Gaza blockaded for getting on for two decades now, which is also against international law. And let's not forget the apartheid system, very much in existence, and very much against international law, along with targeting civilians whose lives are worth so little to them they see them as animals rather than people so the answer is yes Keith yes weeks and months are needed to count up every case but those they're blatant we already know about them because we see it every single day and have done for decades Keir Starmer won't apologize for backing war crimes he aligns his views with the overtly pro-Israeli bias of the US and the EU he will not back a ceasefire for the stupidest reason I possibly ever heard yet still backs aid going in as long as Israel can be allowed to fire upon it apparently I am again reminded that not a single Labour figure has resigned over any of this yet they queued up to do so on the hour every hour under Jeremy Corbyn who funnily enough is calling for a bloody ceasefire 
So as much as I can condemn Starmer, the rest of them standing by him and are equally all complicit. I am sickened that this charade within the Labour Party when people's lives are at stake is still ongoing. You expect this sort of thing from the Tories who have little to no value for life aside from their own. And you don't need to leave this country to see that. Just look at the long-term sick and disabled and how they've been treated for the last 13 years. But Labour are right back to the bad old days of Blair and Co. in their disregard for the casualties of war. Their wrong-headedness, their nonsensical politicisation of such matters. We don't want to see any more people die. End of. So call a ceasefire. The time you stop backing the US and EU is the time they'll have to start listening. Because all of a sudden, they've lost a bit of major support. We're on the UN Security Council. Permanent members, even an opposition leader like Starmer as a result, can have influence there instead of being in lockstep with Sunak as he is on this. Vote to get the Tories out, not if you're voting for Starmer you aren't. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Please do have your say on this in the comments below and be part of the conversation too. Are you still backing Starmer here or more sick of him than I am even? on this. Do let me know what your thoughts are. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Starmer loyalist Peter Kyle, a former aid worker no less, said much the same thing on Sunday morning. Career before what you've seen and done and know to be the answer to conflict. Seemingly the message for Starmerite drones or from this one certainly and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers folks. Right, so whenever you want to know what a government is really up to, news of a leak of their intentions to the media is often the most revealing and allegedly leaked documents from the Israeli Ministry of Intelligence, no less, might have just told the world what Benjamin Netanyahu's actual plans for the Gaza Strip are. And it should probably surprise nobody at this point that it amounts to yet another land grab. According to these documents, Israel wants to push the two million or so civilian inhabitants of the Gaza Strip over the border and into the Sinai Desert in Egypt. The plan, according to this, is to depopulate Gaza. Right, so is it so hard to believe that Israel's endgame here is to depopulate Gaza? I don't think so. You don't even have to go back any further than the events of the 7th of October to see that. The indiscriminate bombing, the alleged rescue of hostages that for some reason involves bombing churches and hospitals, the targeting of Hamas in their tunnels, though airstrikes hardly seem to be the best solution if they're hiding underground. Also make your minds up, Israel, are they in the tunnels or hiding in civilian infrastructure? We can't decide which or don't actually care. We keep hearing about the numbers of civilians who have died, numbering in the thousands, almost half of whom are children, but pray do tell how many Hamas operatives have been killed or captured. That's a stat I've never hear. I've not heard those numbers yet. Only that. At any rate, the Israeli Ministry of Intelligence, it would appear, have a leak, because their plans for Gaza at the end of the day might just have been exposed. A 10-page document had been leaked to the Israeli magazine Mekomet, you might imagine, an Israeli publication wouldn't run an anti-Israeli story, an anti-Netanyahu story. However, Mekomet, I do hope I'm saying that right, are a joint enterprise of Israeli and Palestinian journalists. Citizen journalism, as they call it. So they're very much an alternative media kind of a source. Their about pages state that they are committed to democracy, are resisting the occupation. To be honest, reading up on them, it made me wonder why Benjamin Netanyahu has truly allowed them to persist. But at any rate... They're no friends of the regime, and that's likely why they ran this story. And indeed, this information was leaked to them and their man, Yuval Avraham, a chap whose personal bio on the site says it's, he's all about a dream of justice and equality for all the inhabitants of the country between the river and the sea. Yes, he says that in his blurb, which apparently is an anti-Semitic thing to say amongst the idiot politicians we keep electing in this country. So... Ten pages of this document. I'd seen a few passages translated on social media because the website of McComet is understandably in Hebrew, as is the leaked document. But thank goodness for Google Translate, eh? One downloaded PDF and translation later, and I have the whole thing in English. Essentially, what it boils down to is Israel looking at three options, three alternatives to the status quo, as it were, even though the status quo is where Israel hold all the cards already, isn't it, and treat the Gazan population as... POWs in effect, given they control everything that goes in and out of the Strip, not least the people there. Here's what the executive summary says. The State of Israel is required to bring about significant change in the civilian reality in the Gaza Strip in light of crimes by Hamas that led to the Iron Swords War, which is what Israel are calling this latest conflict. For that, it must decide the political goal in relation to one, 
the civilian population of Gaza, which must be pursued at the same time as the overthrow of the Hamas regime. Two, the target to be defined by the government requires intensive action to harness the US and other countries in support of this goal. So basically, under the auspices of rooting out Hamas, Israel plans on changing the basic way of life for all Palestinians, and this must be done at the same time. I've often wondered how they can work out who is Hamas and who isn't, given Hamas don't exactly advertise their presence. They don't wear a uniform. Is this why they have to deal with both civilians and Hamas at the same time? Is that their excuse? It's also notable they require the US and other countries, i.e. us here in the UK. Let's not be funny about it. We'll be there too. They'll be talking about supporting countries here to aid them in that. So if you were wondering why ceasefires aren't being backed in Western pro-Israel governments and wannabe governments in the case of Keir Starmer, then this is a good indicator as to why that might actually be the case. In order to deliver on both of these directives, the Israeli state are making three assumptions because, well, making assumptions at a time of war, that's never going to be a bad thing, is it? Anyway, their three basic assumptions to make their directives work are, one, the collapse of Hamas, Two, the evacuation of the population outside the combat zone in the interests of the citizens of the Gaza Strip. Yeah, right. And three, plan and channel international aid. Okay, so the first one is obvious as to why Israel would want that. The third point on aid. I would heavily question aid for whom, because it doesn't say. And if Israel is channeling where it will go, who's to say it's ever going to reach any Palestinians? Especially when you consider point two, to remove civilians from the combat zone. Well, why is that a thing? Have you not already told people in the north to evacuate to the south? Do you mean you've got to help those that can't evacuate? The hospital patients that you might be threatening to bomb. Babies and incubators to move south and get them out of the way. Well, I very much doubt that since Israel has been bombing the south as well, hasn't it? Targeting civilians, even targeting the Rafa crossing border, who have done as they've instru been instructed to do after all. They've moved south. They've gone south and you've bombed them anyway. Or you bomb them en route, as you've seen convoys travelling north to south targeted as well. Well, let's come on to those three options I mentioned at the start. The three options before Israel, according to this leaked document, that they have before them. The three alternatives to how things currently are. The first alternative is that the population remain in Gaza and they bring in Palestinian Authority rule. In other words, Israel ending the blockade, on the face of it, and allowing the Gaza Strip to be governed by the same authority currently running the West Bank, running in the loosest possible sense though. Well the West Bank still gets targeted by Israel of course, so this to me wouldn't change anything from the Palestinian perspective at all as to where we are now. It would be a change on paper by and large. Israel would still control them to all intents and purposes and carry on treating them like animals as they do now. The second alternative is that the population remain in Gaza and Gaza runs itself independent of Israel and the West Bank, running itself, its own authority. That, again, sounds okay on paper. I'm sure they would like that. But they need control over all of their comings and goings over the border as a result and all the resources that are currently being controlled by Israel. Would that all come as part of that deal? Because if not, again, what actually changes? But the third alternative is the one that has alarms going off in people's heads. Evacuation of the population of Gaza into the Sinai. That's going a fair bit further than sending half the population of the Gaza Strip south that's sending all 2.2 million people into the Sinai Desert of Egypt. Doesn't Egypt get a say in this? Besides, once you've eliminated Hamas, what guarantee does the world have that you'd let them all back in afterwards? After all, you've not got a good track record for doing that, have you, Israel? I've said from the get-go that this is all about a land grab, and if Israel force out the people of Gaza, they will seize Gaza Strip for themselves and strip it and I'll I just add it to Israeli property and in would come the settlers. To no surprise whatsoever, I'm sure to you, this is the favourite option. Israel doesn't like the idea of Palestinian rule in any form because they suffer strategic implications for Israel. And they are also seen, particularly alternative one, as victories for the Palestinian national movement and harm Israel's security. Now, they like the idea of forcing people out into the desert. How we're very biblical of them. In their words, this is the alternative that will yield positive and long-term strategic results for Israel. Yeah, by making all those people eat Egypt's problem. How long before many of them would end up becoming other countries' problems, though? How many of them would end up on small boats crossing the channel wanting to come here as time went on? Our government, Lord Starmer's pretense of an opposition, will call for a ceasefire. So if this comes to pass and these people come here, 
it'll be on them too. All the more so if the UK becomes one of the countries to assist in this matter. We know the US will. Are we really not going to go there, therefore? Of course we will. Push the Palestinians off more of their land. Of course, this is what Israel favours. They've been doing it since 1948. They haven't finished the job. And with Gaza gone, they can turn all their focus on the West Bank then, which has also been bombed in recent days by Israel, despite there being no Hamas there whatsoever. Blind eye cast of that, of course, in our media. We hear these demands for Hamas to return the 229 hostages they hold, and well, they should, but Israel is currently holding some 1,500 Palestinian hostages from the West Bank. Where's the cry for their return? Land grab. Mark my words, and if this leaked report is legitimate, it's certainly believable. But if it is legitimate too, and time will tell that our government support or assist in this, then we'll be complicit in ethnic cleansing. I can't live with that, could you? Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do have your say on this in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video tw recommendation where twisting the truth and pulling a fast one isn't just for oppressors and sycophantic governments providing them with cover and acting in their favour. It always comes back to the media and the BBC is one of the worst offenders, proving itself thus just this weekend gone. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so yesterday Israel, in its pursuit of Hamas, they say, have bombed a refugee camp in northern Gaza. Yep, refugee camp. Hundreds dead, allegedly, because a Hamas commander was hiding there, apparently, in complete contravention of the Geneva Convention, specifically Article 51, which covers the protections of a civilian population. Israel have admitted to doing this. It would be pretty hard to excuse their actions given the size of the crater left behind right in the middle of where that refugee camp was. 400 innocent Palestinians have been killed by Israel, numbers are that have been reported, who felt this level of force to bring down one person was justified because they had told these people to go south. Anyone justifying Israeli atrocity on this scale has got to be truly depraved. To target something like a refugee camp truly depraved so sadly enter both the tories and labor who have both defended this a vote for either of these pro-israeli parties is a vote for more innocent blood to be spilled we need to oppose this it's basic humanity to say we do not support this surely we don't seem to have such people in power or getting ready for it right so last time israel were implicated in targeting civilians that was the al ali baptist church their defenders said it couldn't be israel at the time because there was no big hole in the ground where Israel's superior weaponry would have hit. Well, here's a big hole in the ground, and this is a refugee camp, so defend this one then. 400 dead, according to Medicine Sans Frontières. They're reporting that large numbers of wounded people have also been moved to the Al Shifa hospital, including young children with deep wounds and severe burns, many having lost their parents and being sole survivors. But there have been reports of entire families having been wiped out in this attack. One aid worker pulled a newborn baby from its dead mother's arms. Israel would have you believe that targeting such a refugee camp is entirely justified, though. US news channel CNN have been doing a BBC, frankly, bending over backwards for Israel. But they weren't quite prepared for Israel to admit what they'd done here on live TV, as Israeli Defence Force spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht a man who was born near Glasgow, incidentally, so giving off very strong settler vibes here, confirmed what they'd done. When asked by CNN's Wolf Blitzer if Israel in fact did go ahead and drop bombs on Jabalia, the name of this refugee camp, knowingly on innocent civilians to get to this Hamas commander allegedly hiding there, Hecht replied, that's not what you're hearing. We again focused on this commander. You'll get more data on who this man was. They killed many, many Israelis. We're doing everything we can. It's a very complicated battle space. There could be infrastructure there. There could be tunnels there. And we're still looking into that. That wasn't an answer to his question. So Blitzer asked again. But you know, there are a lot of refugees, a lot of men, women and children in that refugee camp as well, right? It is a refugee camp. You would imagine most of the people there would be innocent. Hecht was shaking his head as Blitzer was finishing what he was saying. He answered, this is the tragedy of War Wolf. I mean, we, as you know, have been saying for days, move south. Civilians that are not involved with Hamas, please move south. 
Still not got the answer he wanted, though. So Blitzer pushed again. I'm just trying to get a little bit more information, he said. You knew there were civilians there. You knew there were refugees, all sorts of refugees. But you decided to drop a bomb on that refugee camp, attempting to kill that Hamas commander. By the way, was he killed? This time he got an answer, though in no way the one he expected. Hecht replied by saying, yes, we know he was killed. About the civilians there, we're doing everything we can to minimise. I'll say it again. Sadly, there are hi they are hiding amongst them the civilian population. And again, we're doing this stage by stage. And we're going to go after every one of these terrorists who was involved in that heinous attack on the 7th of October. CNN suddenly experienced technical issues, which weren't apparent on screen. The look on Blitzer's face appeared to be that he was being told something into his earpiece to end the interview. After all, they were backing Israel, and one of their commanders had just attempted to justify killing hundreds of refugees to get one man. Hector admitted to committing a war crime on live TV. You don't target innocent civilians, ever. It's there in Article 51 of the Geneva Convention, which protects civilian populations. And the relevant section of this convention here is what it says about indiscriminate attacks, which are defined in Article 51 as those not directed at a specific military objective, those which employ a method or means of combat which cannot be limited as required and consequently are of a nature to strike military objectives and civilians or civilian ob objects without distinction, dropping a bomb on a refugee camp to take out one man seems to meet the terms of an indiscriminate attack to me then. Sadly, our leaders and their parties disagree. The Tories wheeled out their go-to sycophant Oliver Dowden, who spoke to Kate Burley on Sky News this morning, who put to him, the IDF have admitted bombing Jabila refugee camp with civilian casualties. Is that still within international law as far as the British government is concerned? Well, we know what the Geneva Convention says, so what say you, Tory boy? Dowden came back with, well, this is the reality of the conflict with an organisation like Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organisation that has murdered in cold blood over a thousand innocent Israeli men, women and children, and now seeks to hide amongst the civilian population. This is a very difficult conflict. We continue to urge the Israeli government to abide by international law. I believe the Israeli government is continuing to do so. So according to this dimwit, who is actually the deputy prime minister, if Sunak takes a sickie, he's running the country, folks, who says that Israel has the right to bomb innocent Palestinian men, women and children, and is acting within international law by doing so in retaliation for Hamas, killing innocent Israeli men, women and children. That's not just supporting indiscriminate attack as laid out in the Geneva Convention, but it's tacitly supporting the apartheid regime because some lives, clearly by inference, by Dowden's own words, are worth more than others. Why should we be surprised by a government whose leaders suck up to Netanyahu to avoid some tricky by-elections, telling him he hopes he wins, remains resolutely on Israel's side even after they commit atrocity? And it just greenlit Israel to do it again. Blood on their hands. Thanks very much, Sunak. But what about Labour then? Well, this attack came just two hours after Keir Starmer's disgusting speech yesterday, ruling out ceasefires entirely. 400 dead innocent Palestinians proved you wrong yet again, Keith, as usual, as always, because Starmer never gets these calls right. But then he's pinned his leadership and his path to power on propping up and supporting the Israeli state and their government, one of the most hardline right-wing governments on the planet. Well, it wasn't Starmer confirming that Labour remained in lockstep with the Tories on this issue this morning. It was David Lammy, the wannabe next foreign secretary on Radio 4's Today programme. He said, it's clear to me that it's wrong to bomb a refugee camp, but clearly, if there is a military objective, it can be legally justifiable. It's for Israel to explain its actions. What an absolute moron. Legally justified. Lamy is literally to politics what a handbrake is to a canoe. The Geneva Conventions, again, I'll come back to them, and all the articles within it are international law. Article 51 is explicit in what is not permitted in the form of indiscriminate attacks, which is precisely what this was. There is no exception. You want to be foreign secretary, learn the law. Article 51 literally concerns civilians during conflict. It is illegal. It is a war crime without exception. People need dragging to the Hague for this. And our government and those who wish to form one should be saying that. Should be saying as much, not 
falling over themselves to try and justify mass murder of innocent people. In what way is Israel any better than Hamas in this? As for Starmer himself, you will not believe what he's done today. He's only gone and had the nerve, in light of all of this, in light of that speech yesterday, to put out a short video on Islamophobia Awareness Month and how he stands with the Muslim communities today. Have you apologised to the Islamic Centre you weaponised in South Wales the other week yet? 400, most certainly majority Muslim people, lost their lives yesterday, just after you'd finished standing in Chatham House, itself dubiously funded, saying how you were on the side of the bombers. Every time I think Starmer can't make me even more sick and by him, he goes one step further. Amoral, utterly self-serving, driven by his own wants and desires and his lust for power, a vote for him is exactly the same as a vote for the Tories. It's a vote for more innocent blood on British hands. I know my hands will not be tainted by this complicity when I next go to vote. How about you? Now, this was the natural conclusion to this video. But as I was finishing up, news has broken that the Jabalia refugee camp has just been bombed for a second time. I thought that Scottish IDF bloke said they killed the Hamas commander, so why have they bombed refugees again? Another 50 people are dead in that refugee camp now. Another 150 are wounded. And because Israel is still cutting off fuel supplies, ambulances are running out. I have no words for this anymore. I've run out. Motor mouth like me, I can't think of one to describe this. But I know one thing. My disgust at those still supporting this regime grows daily. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do have your say on these events and what our apparent leaders are saying and be part of the conversation too. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Netanyahu's plans for Gaza appear to have been leaked and have now been authenticated. So really, does he care whether Palestinians live or die as long as they get out of Gaza? Well, what do his latest actions make it look like? I'll hopefully see you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so whilst our leaders here insult our intelligence, pretend international law isn't getting broken indiscriminately by Israel, and frankly coming out with vomit-inducing levels of excuses and sycophancy for the apartheid state, there are world leaders calling this out. The first rumbles of this were coming from Spain as their Minister of Social Rights and General Secretary Podemos, Iona Ballara, called out Israel in recent weeks, most recently telling the pro-Israeli European Union to cut ties with Israel amidst the atrocities going on. But she's not alone. And some other world leaders have got a damn sight further, cutting ties and recalling ambassadors, standing against the apartheid state, saying enough is enough, and refusing point blank to entertain their excuses and let their atrocities slide any further. Right, so whilst our main party leaders seemingly contort themselves into whatever position they think makes them most attractive to the apartheid regime of Benjamin Netanyahu, other leaders, better leaders, frankly. We do keep letting ourselves be led by the least amongst us, as they are not only calling Israel out for the atrocities they are committing, but are following that up with action too. Ioni Ballara was one of the first to garner public attention to the fact some politicians in the West were actually condemning Israel, when just the other day she took on the European Union's pro-Israel attitudes, denouncing them utterly and saying in no uncertain terms that Netanyahu should be at the International Criminal Court. Absolutely. Drag him to the Hague. Like here and many other countries, Spain has held demonstrations against what Israel is doing in solidarity with Palestine, calling for that ceasefire. And on one such march a few days ago, Ballara said, Today we are here accompanying the people of our country and also all of those who are demanding that this planned genocide, this ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people done by the state of Israel, end once and for all. We think all European leaders, including ours, are not up to the task or don't grasp the severity of the circumstances. We don't want to be complicit in this planned genocide and we think Europe has to act urgently. I think Europe is going to pay dearly, very dearly, for this hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of preaching human rights around the world, and then, when you have to stand up for them, when you have to live up to them, we do absolutely nothing. She's not wrong, and she's certainly showing no discrimination herself, attacking her own government as well as the EU, even though she's a minister in that government. She's in the Podemos party, and the governing party is the PSOE, the Spanish president is... Pedro Sanchez and he's basically hiding from the issue entirely so it's good that a government minister even if she's from another party 
which seems strange by our politics, this kind of a setup, but at least somebody is calling it out. Other national leaders are not as shy as Sanchez, though, and overnight there have been some developments elsewhere in the world that Israel is not going to like. Bolivia has formally cut off all diplomatic ties with Israel, the official line being that Bolivia condemns the aggressive and disproportionate Israeli military offensive being carried out in the Gaza Strip and was henceforth breaking diplomatic relations with Israel in repudiation of such acts. Bolivia has taken the decision to break diplomatic relations with the State of Israel in repudiation and condemnation of the aggressive and disproportionate Israeli military offensive being carried out in Gaza, having only restored relations in 2019, having severed them previously, again, back then, over Israeli aggression in the Gaza Strip. They have sent an official communication to the State of Israel to make their decision to break diplomatic relations again known. And as a result, Bolivia have become the first Latin American country to officially cut ties with Israel since the events of October the 7th. Though, to be honest, have any other countries anywhere actually done this yet? Because I haven't heard of any. I haven't found any. Although apparently the Israeli ambassador to Colombia has already been expelled from that country. In fact, Colombia... Funnily enough, it's the country I'm coming to next. So that was a nice little segue there. They, along with Chile, have recalled their ambassadors from Israel to report on the situation there. Colombian President Gustavo Petro took to Twitter saying, I have decided to call our ambassador in Israel for consultation. If Israel does not stop the massacre of the Palestinian people, we cannot be there. Chile has a historical issue with Israel. For example, Israel backed the dictator Augusto Pinochet and Chile actually has the largest Palestinian population outside of Palestine itself. Their president, Gabriel Boric, has also taken to Twitter saying, given the unacceptable violations of international humanitarian law that Israel has incurred in the Gaza Strip, as the government of Chile, we have resolved to call the Chilean ambassador to Israel, Jorge Carvajal, I hope I said that right, to Santiago for consultations. Chile strongly condemns and observes with great concern that these military operations which at this point in their development entail collective punishment of the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza, do not respect fundamental norms of international law, as demonstrated by the more than 8,000 civilian victims, mostly women and children. Very well put, I thought. Along with these three South American nations, Brazil's President Lula has also spoken out against Israel, saying the terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel did not justify the killing of millions of innocents in Gaza. Bit of an exaggeration on the numbers, but sure, absolutely, the sentiment can't possibly disagree with. Brazil, interestingly enough, currently holds the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council. Now, how much clout it has there when the US, as a, as a permanent council member, have vetoes over everything which they are using to provide cover for Israel and have a long record of doing just that. Preserving the US foothold in the Middle East that Israel provides and turning a blind eye to atrocities, it does so, presumably being the driving factor behind that. Every other country that acts like an American political lapdog, therefore, follows suit. They do whatever the US does. Now, what do all these countries have in common, though, that have been calling Israel out, though? Oh, they're all South American, yes. Well, they're all led by left-wing governments as well. Funny that. I suppose that's what comes from being targeted for decades by capitalist interference. They reject it. No, oh, look, they end up on the right side of history regarding this conflict as a result. Another leftist, the former Bolivian president, and indeed proof of that capitalist interference that saw him deposed, is Evo Morales, now living in Argentina. He'd also taken to Twitter to have his say on this, in response to his own country's actions, in fact, saying, Finally! And under pressure from the people, the government has decided to break diplomatic relations with Israel. He does so after being in power for three years and after the Israeli regime murdered more than eight and a half thousand people, almost half of them boys and girls. This is not enough. Bolivia must declare the state of Israel as a terrorist state and file a complaint with the International Criminal Court. The people of Bolivia will always accompany the people of Palestine. The government has the duty to take these steps. He's not mincing his words at all. And I totally agree with that. The current president of Boli Bolivia, Luis Arce, was Morales' former finance minister. So no love lost there, it would seem. But this, of course, puts Morales on the same page as Spain's Ioni Ballara. That international law must be upheld and the full weight of it must be applied to Israel. And no longer must that state be afforded some kind of, well, if you can excuse the pun, get out of jail free card every time they commit an act of atrocity against Palestinians getting away with it by 
calling their accusers anti-Semites or however else they choose to get defended on other nations that are doing the cover, playing the cover for them. More countries need to come under more pressure to follow the leadership being shown by South America right now in this issue. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do have your say on this story in the comments below and be part of the conversation too. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where here in the UK so much as saying the wrong thing to the wrong politician can get you suspended on this matter between Israel and Palestine. But in Labour, that happens even when you didn't say what they say you did, especially if you're a lefty. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer has discovered it is Islamophobia Awareness Month this month. And this is remarkable, not just because this will be the fourth Islamophobia Awareness Month since he became leader, but that this is the first time he's ever actually acknowledged it. But because it comes hot on the heels of his Chatham House speech, where he again has ruled out a ceasefire in the ongoing atrocities being committed in Gaza, unpopular and tin to the point he had to scuttle out of the back door, and straight into his car amidst the protesters yelling murderer at him, amongst other things. Regular viewers will know that Starmer's stance is in direct opposition not just to 89% of the British public, but to Labour mayors up and down the country, other Labour representatives, the Scottish Labour leader, and of course there have been numerous resignations from the party of Labour councillors sickened by his unashamed pro-Israel stance and his refusal to join calls to end the death tolls and call for a ceasefire. Starmer put out a video supporting Islamophobia Awareness Month, though, and he has been rinsed on social media over it, not least because by posting it on the 1st of November, it came the day after Israeli airstrikes targeted a refugee camp in Gaza, but because an hour after he posted it, Israel targeted that refugee camp again. His praise for Islamophobia Awareness Month comes despite no call for a ceasefire still, and while it, has, while it is still fresh in our minds, he has already weaponized an Islamic centre in South Wales for his own political ends as well. He's doing it again here. He's desperate to win back lost Muslim votes while still not changing his stance on Israel. Right, so Keir Starmer, in another ill-advised act, has put out a video praising Islamophobia Awareness Month, something that will add to the upset he's already caused, the blatant cynicism this will invoke in people, and continue to upset Muslim communities up and down the country, and those supporting the plight of Palestinians in Gaza as they get bombed no matter where they are, be they in the north, where they've been ordered to evacuate to the south, whether they could or they couldn't do so, be they targeted en route southwards, or whether they are actually already in the south. I think targeting them there was to force Egypt to open that Rafa border crossing, also bombed, rather than let fellow Muslims die whilst cornered. But Israel have also bombed churches, hospitals, mosques and refugee camps. There's literally nothing they won't target. Multiple breaches of the Geneva Conventions on the face of it and international law as a result which just isn't getting called out strongly enough. The US, the UK, the EU, all are complicit in their tacit support and silence in not upholding international law as they're supposed to, but upholding Israel as an exception to it. The calls to hold them accounts and all come from South America, from other Middle Eastern countries such as Yemen, who are threatening attacks on Israel now themselves, or Qatar. And it has to be said, as far as media sources going covering the events in Gaza, Qatari-based Al Jazeera, Pretty much second to none right now. Anyway, back to Starmer. In what can only be seen as a blatant attempt to try and win back the Muslim vote, his actions on the Israel and Gaza issue, having taken a side instead of calling for a ceasefire, hiding behind the nonsense that is a humanitarian pause to excuse that, sending an aid whilst it can still be attacked is a farce. But he has gone in front of the camera and for the first time ever, not only recognised Islamophobia Awareness Month, but praised it. Now often at this point I'll put an excerpt from what he said from such things into my content here, but frankly I couldn't stomach what Starmer did have to say here. In my opinion, blatantly weaponising Islamophobia for votes by pretending to give a damn about it here in the UK, whilst ignoring what is happening to Muslims abroad. Yes, Islamophobia is a problem here. It is a societal ill, as all forms of racism are. Yes, people are attacked for the colour of their skin, for the coming and going from mosques, for the clothing they might wear, and of course that is wrong, it should always be called out. But not from a guy who hasn't given one-eighth of a shit about it until his vote share amongst the Muslim population, who, on the whole, have always backed Labour, fell by 62 points in a recent Muslim census poll. In that disgust, in that cynicism for what Starmer is pulling here, not to mention the obvious timing of it. I was far from alone, because when you put stuff like this on Twitter, you will be held accountable by people equally as disgusted as me by this. 
Busy Eating Crayons called it the longest electoral suicide video in history. British activist David Rosenberg wrote, Trouble is, Starmer seems to be a serial liar. He is normally lying when you see his mouth moving. Where is his concern for Islamophobia when it comes to supporting Absana Begum? Or when it comes to supporting Muslims who show empathy with Palestinians? Now, I've spoken of Labour MP Absana Begum before, a survivor of domestic violence, a Muslim, the first hijab-wearing MP in the UK. Sadly for her, she's a lefty too, and so Starmer has turned a blind eye to the ongoing attacks on her by her local Labour Party, not least by members of the family of her ex-husband. The trauma of it all getting so bad, she actually ended up hospitalised. So Rosenberg raises a very telling point there. Starmer's never, off, never offered her any solidarity. Miltos Yerlimiu, who played Sirio Farrell in Game of Thrones, and is another outspoken political commentator, said, You don't use and manipulate Muslim leaders misrepresenting them and expect to be taken seriously. A liar. A comment harking back to that meet and greet in South Wales, I felt, which Starmer then weaponized to his own ends, who took to Twitter and basically said he told the Muslims he met there that the Israeli hostages Hamas are holding must be released. Which thus implies all Muslims are Hamas, all are terrorists, and which has done the most damage to his prospects of winning the Muslim vote over. He still has not apologised to them either. This is a man incapable of admitting to his mistakes and saying, I'm sorry. He never can. He never does. And that is a massive weakness in anybody, but especially dangerous in one who wants to lead the country. These were, to say the least, some of the more repl polite responses. Naturally, it also attracted comments from the far right too, attacking Starmer as well, but obviously for entirely different and far more depraved reasons. If the mainstream media did its job right, though, it wouldn't take a hypocritical video or an ill-advised trip to an Islamic centre in South Wales to show people that Starmer is not on the side of Muslims. They should ask why the Labour Party complaints page on their website only has a bespoke complaints option for anti-Semitism. All other forms of racism have to use a generic link. They should ask why anti-Jewish racism is more important to Labour than any other form. But of course we have a reference to state of the things from an Islamophobia perspective in the Labour Party under Keir Starmer in the form of both the Labour Leaks report, which the media fixated on only in finding out who leaked it and not what it contained, and Starmer is very much of the same mindset, and of course the Ford report, commissioned by Starmer to assess the state of racism within the Labour Party, which Starmer continues to ignore because it didn't pin the blame on Corbyn as he'd hoped. Instead it pointed to wider issues which Starmer didn't care about and still doesn't. Starmer has been found to be presiding over a hierarchy of racism, where anti-Semitism is more important, where it is prioritised, and that was done to keep up the scam that Corbyn was a rampant anti-Semite instead of a quietly spoken, quite genial chap who advocates for peace and justice, bothers vegetables and makes jam. He was the dangerous one, though. Now look at Keir Starmer and tell me you weren't conned. Martin Ford, in his report, described the situation of racism under Starmer as there are serious problems of discrimination in the operations of the party and that concerns that the attention to the surge of cases relating to anti-Semitism and the importance they appeared to play in the interfactional conflict meant that the party was in effect operating a hierarchy of racism or of discrimination with other forms of racism and discrimination being ignored. They described this as an untenable situation. His recommendations that Labour adopt a parallel approach is needed with regard to Islamophobia and that as above, anti-Semitism, both forms of prejudice and discrimination need to be integrated into a broader ethical anti-racism education program alongside education on other protected characteristics. Needless to say, it hasn't happened because as already mentioned, Starmer has ignored the report, has not met with Martin Ford to discuss the findings and did in fact ban Labour MPs from meeting with him as well. I highly recommend watching the Al Jazeera documentaries, the Labour Files, particularly the final one interviewing Martin Ford, the only media outlet to have bothered to do so, and hear what he had to say on this directly. Keir Starmer is a charlatan, a fraud and a liar. His sudden devotion to Islamophobia Awareness Month should be viewed with the cynicism it deserves, because he doesn't mean it. He's just doing damage limitation and thinks you're stupid enough to fall for it. Don't. Thanks for watching, I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Please do have your say on this story in the comments below. Be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where other world leaders are indeed calling Israel out for their atrocities, standing by Muslim people in Palestine and the world over. And thank goodness there is some leadership coming forward on this, even if the mainstream media will keep on ignoring it. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks.
Right, so in a recent video I spoke about a leaked Israeli Ministry of Intelligence document which spelt out a number of options before Israel on how to deal with Hamas and the Palestinian civilians living in the Gaza Strip. Whether to allow the Strip to be governed by the Palestinian Authority of the West Bank, whether to let the people of Gaza govern themselves, or the third and preferred option for Israel which was to send all Palestinians into the Sinai. All of these options were of course being developed and they bid to root out and deal with Hamas. But the obvious conclusion to anyone paying the slightest bit of attention to social media and alternative media outlets is that the minute the Gazans are in Egypt, there's no way in hell Israel will ever let them back into Gaza afterwards. I've said it since these latest atrocities began almost a month ago now, that this is a land grab. The leaked memo appears to have borne that out, but an article passed on to me dating from 2017 shows Israel have been planning this for a lot longer. And there's no pretense of various options or dealing with Hamas here. They want the Gaza Strip for Israel. It's planned ethnic cleansing, and we're bearing witness to it now. Right, so I did a video on the smoking gun, or alleged smoking gun of elite Israeli Ministry of Intelligence document. A ten-page piece detailing the options before the Israeli state in dealing with Hamas. With the bits setting off alarm bells being the evacuation of all Palestinian civilians into the Sinai Desert of Egypt, where there is no way on earth that Israel would ever let the Palestinians back in afterwards. It would be in effect a second to Nakba on the basis of taking out Hamas and once done Israel would just take over Gaza and slam the door on the Rafa border crossing. 2.2 million people suddenly becoming Egypt's problem and soon after a problem for the rest of the world uh, in all certainty. You are kidding yourself if you believe otherwise. If Israel succeeded in depopulating Gaza there's enough history of Palestinians being shut out of their homelands the first time around. This time it is happening with the blessing of too many Western countries, sadly including this one. Now I'm as guilty as the next commentator in producing that video in that we thought we had this huge story to break that we'd found that mainstream voices were not talking about it as per usual. And I, but I take some heart in that by having never claimed to be a journalist myself, let alone an investigative journalist, I have no background in any of that. I simply have an eye for scrutiny, I believe. I think we have a pathetic media and I believe it needs calling out and showing up where I see it, and I'm more than happy to have my say on that. But the evidence for Israel's plans for Gaza go back a lot further than this recent leaked document to. As new evidence has been brought to my attention, thanks to a chap called Willie for bringing this to my attention and pointing out where this plan has come up before, in an Israeli political journal called Sovereignty. Now, Sovereignty, despite the fact the copy I was sent was in English, is a little bit of a swine to find online, but the Hebrew word for sovereignty is Ribonut, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and indeed it is under that term that you can find this publication online. Now this journal is the written word essentially of the sovereignty movement in Israel, which was founded back in 2011 by another organisation called Women in Green, who are a far-right grassroots organisation within Israel, utterly devoted to the establishment of a state of Israel. It's no mistake they chose to call their publication sovereignty because they are obsessed with this concept. This publication is basically the go-to read for news and views amongst the settler movement. And with an average print run of some 150,000 copies per issue, it's a monthly, incidentally. It clearly has some clout, though. You can imagine if ever there was an audience for the Israeli right wing to push ideas of taking even more Palestinian land, therefore, then this is the place that they would choose to say their piece. And in relation to the Gaza Strip, a very pertinent story was published in November of 2017, which was an interview with then Israeli Minister for Social Equality, Hila Gamliel, I bet I'm pronouncing her name wrong as well, entitled, If There Will Be a Palestinian State, Then Only in the Sinai. Alarm bells ringing. Yeah? Now Gamliel is the daughter of Yemeni and Libyan Jewish settlers and has a lengthy record as a member of Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party for opposing the setting up of a Palestinian state. She's opposed to it for the Zionist reasoning that they are entitled to that land. It is their ideological belief, of course, isn't it? It is their land. But also, as the recent Ministry of Intelligence documents set out, she believes that a Palestinian state is an existential threat to Israeli security. She's not completely averse to there being a Palestinian state, however, if one has to exist. It isn't her preference, but as long as it isn't anywhere within Israel or the current Palestinian territories, she would accept it. In fact, she's of the belief that if Palestinians want a land of their own so badly, they and other Arab states bordering Israel will agree to her idea of setting one up in the Sinai. She believes this would be acceptable once other states and other countries see that no other possible solution is feasible, so no negotiating them. She believes 
at the actual believed at that time, in 2017, when this article came out, that Egypt would agree in return for aid and help with driving ISIS out of the Sinai. Now, the terrorism of ISIS in northern Sinai, just the northern part of it, was only officially ended in January of this year. The south is another matter. And attacks in the north actually are still ongoing. So this is very much still an issue, especially if you want to put 2.2 million innocent civilians into the mix. The Sinai isn't exactly safe right now. Egypt are being quite cagey. They've been quite dip they, they've been the diplomatic entity, haven't they, acting between Israel and Palestine for some time, because they know if Israel managed to get the Gazan people into the Sinai, they'll then be Egypt's problem and no longer theirs. Now, at the time of this article, Gamaliel spoke in terms of Gazans having a choice of going into the Sinai or not. But if they didn't, then they will still be considered as citizens of Gaza and the Sinai, and they will not get Israeli national status. Therefore, they will still be treated as second-class citizens, apartheid Israel and all the rest of it ongoing. Now, I said a moment ago, a Palestinian state would not be Gamaliel's preference, but she'd accept it if it had to be. In the same article from 2017, though, she was quoted saying, I do not see any reason for establishing another dictatorial state in the Middle East. But if I am forced to address the problem that our ties and relations with other Arab states is limited by the deep-rooted discourse that such a state must exist, then it is better and more appropriate to move it to another place and not in parts of the state of Israel. I think you'll find Palestine is Palestine sunshine. It isn't Israel, no matter how much you will it. Now you might be thinking at this point, Damo, this was six years ago from a minister who is absolutely horrible, but was minister for social equality. Equality for whom? Very much the operative question. What she was saying then, however, is exactly what the leaked document from the Ministry of Intelligence in the last few days has said. So her ideas have been carried forward these past several years. And there's a very good reason for that, because have a guess who is the current Minister of Intelligence in Israel, whose department this most recent document was leaked from. Yes, Hila Gamliel. With allegations that Netanyahu funds Hamas, we have a situation here where Israeli-funded, well, allegedly Israeli-funded Palestinian terrorists have killed innocent Israelis in southern Israel, took others hostage. Israel's attempts at re rescuing said hostages has been to bomb Gaza incessantly, not worrying about how many of these hostages or innocent Palestinians get killed chasing down Hamas, who they are also allegedly funding, as I've said. Gazans have been driven south, have been attacked on the way, and been attacked when they get there. So the Rafa crossing into Egypt, into the Sinai, opens. The Ministry of Intelligence are favouring, according to the recent leak, moving all Palestinian civilians into the Sinai for their own safety, even though ISIS might still be operating there. Are we really supposed to believe that the woman running the Ministry of Intelligence, who came up with a plan to move Palestinians into the Sinai six years ago, isn't using the cover of all of this violence to see her plan enacted and delivered? To see Palestinians, Palestinians moved out of Gaza, never to be allowed back, and permit Israel to seize that land on the basis it is theirs by some kind of divine right. I believe the end game here has been exposed, but what do you think? Do you let me know your thoughts in the comments below and be part of the conversation? Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation covering the ins and outs of that 10-page leak memo. Just to add more context to this one, if you haven't seen it already, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer has caused so much anger within his party now that matters have escalated to calls for him to resign. He has for weeks now staunchly stood by Israel's right to defend itself, or defend herself, as he likes to put it. The lobbyist's line, that is. Backed Israel in committing war crimes before denying he ever said that he did. Never apologised for that. He tried to make things better by going to a Muslim centre and telling them to hand over the hostages. But not all Muslims are Hamas, especially ones in South Wales, or even Palestinians for that matter. And he caused more anger over his politicisation of that event. The centre having no clue this is what he'd later say, that this is what he had planned. He never apologised for that either. He then went to Trevor Chin funded Chatham House, the pro-Israel Blairite Labour donor Trevor Chin, Starmer himself of course, is Trevor Chin funded. Chin funds all manner of other pro-Israel Labour politicians and institutions and is a chair of the Jewish Leadership Council. At Chatham House, Starmer went on to give a speech, again reinforcing Israel's right to do what it is doing, refuse to be drawn on whether they are committing war crimes or not, though of course had no problems not so long ago, accusing Vladimir Putin on live TV of being a war criminal. 
20 times as many civilians have been killed in three weeks in Gaza as have been killed in the entire Russia-Ukraine conflict. So little wonder the calls for him to go have increased to the point we're now at. And still he won't budge. Right, so if Keir Starmer was hoping his ongoing interventions were going to calm things down and he'd get away with his pro-Israeli anti-ceasefire, his let's give Gaza aid as long as Israel can still target it attitude, then he's been very much mistaken. As if anything, things have continued to escalate. At least 36 Labour councillors have now quit the Labour Party and the more Starmer seems to come out and say on the matter, the worse he seems to make things for himself. And that's no surprise really, when his narrative has never changed. He is still staunchly standing by Israel, against Hamas. Of course, we're all against Hamas, but Israel is an aggressor too. And oh dear, never mind all those Palestinian civilians that are getting caught up in the crossfire. He will not call for a ceasefire to help them. He seems to think we will believe him if he tells us everyone is downing their tools will lead to even more violence. He takes us for fools. A poll of Labour councillors yesterday showed that some 43% of them are dissatisfied with the party position on Israel and Palestine, with some 37% of them satisfied with it. That's especially notable when you consider that Starmer has been purging the left from the party for years. And party representation, much like its membership, has become gradually more skewed to the right over time. So it's not like this is an obvious indicator of left-wing disgust. This is across the party left to right in a party that has become, overall, more right-wing. Let's not forget who he's being advised in all of this by, though, of course. Peter Mandelson, the Prince of Darkness, resurrected from his Blairite crypt, where D. Reams things can only get better, plays on a loop and a poster of Blair with his biggest rictus grin, just where he lays his head, right next to another picture of Jeffrey Epstein, I expect. Starmer dusted off this relic of the 1990s where he should have been left, and if you wanted an idea of the sort of advice he might be giving to Starmer right now, the wrong advice, the 30 years out of date advice, when he was on Robert Peston's show this week, and he said of Starmer on that show, I think what he is doing is demonstrating to the British people the sort of toughness and metal that he would display if he were to become Prime Minister of this country. He has been very tough very realistic about facing up to the implications, the consequences of what Hamas has done. And in doing so, he's absolutely demonstrated that he is determined to break with Jeremy Corbyn on national security issues. He did it before Ukraine. He's now done it again on a map. Guess who's still living rent-free in Mandy's head? He literally spat the man's name out. He couldn't resist but shoehorn Corbyn into the conversation. A man who he said during his leadership that he worked every day to bring down. Mandelson, the man who preferred the Tories to a socialist-led Labour Party, who is now advising the current Labour leader. Is it any wonder Starmer is seen with such disgust now? What Starmer is doing right now is being tough like he was over Ukraine. Well, his tough looks an awful lot like turning a blind eye to genocide to me. And since you mentioned Ukraine, the hypocrisy of that situation is writ large when he had no issue calling Putin a war criminal in his attacks on Ukraine before there was any evidence available for him to draw on, but he cannot say the same of Israel, despite 20 times more innocent Gazan civilians having been killed in the last several weeks there than Ukrainians have been since the war began between Ukraine and Russia more than a year and a half ago. Mandelson epitomizes the leadership of the Labour Party right now, but the fact they are losing huge numbers of voters right now, especially Muslim ones, are losing members, are losing councillors, and none of it apparently deterring them, because the polling numbers over the Tories show they're on the road to power, regardless of them having shown their true colours, regardless of these people that are walking away from the party in disgust. We're standing his ground and proving his toughness and metal might be Mandelson's way, might be Mandelson's thinking of Starmer, his view. All it is doing amongst the wider Labour Party is escalating matters. The entire Labour group of Sheffield City Council joined a Green Party motion calling for an immediate ceasefire. In Blackburn, where nine councillors have quit Labour, they've actually got as far as to form a whole new party. This actually followed a meeting with Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner and was triggered because she wouldn't back a ceasefire either. Further to that, there is now talk of national coordination to challenge Labour in at least a dozen of their seats. This is the sort of action no poll is able to reflect. And the latest and not insignificant move, something I can see having a real ripple effect to other parts of the country, is now a direct call for Starmer's resignation. Made all the more emphatic because it is a joint letter, a joint call for his resignation from the council leaders of two Labour-run councils. Councillors 
Afra Siab Anwar, I guarantee I've said that wrong, and Asjad Mahmood of Burnley Borough Council and Pendle Borough Council respectively, issued a press release relating to this, saying, Councillors call on Keir Starmer to step down. Leaders of Burnley and Pendle Labour groups have called up Labour leader Keir Starmer to consider his position as leader of the party and step down to allow a leadership election. The call on behalf of Labour councillors in their respective areas follows hundreds of Labour councillors and MPs calling on the leader to put pressure on the government to call for a ceasefire to prevent any further loss of innocent lives in Gaza. Councillor Anwar said, I and colleagues across Burnley over the last few weeks have seen the sad loss of people, including young children in Palestine and Israel, and this has to stop immediately. I joined the Labour Party because of the values of standing up and speaking out against injustices across the world. Sadly, Keir Starmer has not stood up for Labour values, hence why we are calling upon him to step down. Blindly following the position of Rishi Sunak is not acceptable to us and our residents who we represent. Councillor Azjad Mahmood added, I and my fellow Labour colleagues have seen the distressing loss of lives on both sides of this conflict and have been putting pressure on the party leader to lead calls for a ceasefire to stop the innocent loss of lives. Unfortunately, he has failed to listen and we ask he consider his position and resign to allow someone to lead our party who has compassion and speaks out against injustice and indiscriminate killings on innocent human beings. They're not mincing their words. They've definitely had enough and haven't we all? Both main party leaders are devoid of compassion completely here. Israeli weapons being used to bomb out Gaza, targeting civilians indiscriminately, which is a war crime. Weapons too often we're supplying. Obviously, and you have, and you have Sunak telling Netanyahu he hopes he wins. And you have Starmer saying Israel can cut off water and power, followed by incessant denials of that. When we all heard him say it, the very latest rumour, and it is only a rumour at this stage, is that a leadership challenge is actually brewing now though unfortunately it is also alleged that the challenger is coming from another right winger that does however spell out the damage starmer is doing to the party right now that a member of his own end of the labor party has decided he's too much of a liability now and has to go who it is i don't know who do you think it might be you can have a guess according to a morning star article out today though two-fifths of the current cabinet where a challenge is likely to or most likely to be coming from have benefited from funding by pro-israeli groups 40 percent of them so if this is true and a challenge does come that's a lot of prominent mps who might make life difficult for any next potential leader regardless of whether they be left or right if they take too much of an anti-israel stance for their liking regardless of the mood and feelings of the greater movement labor mps are in a bubble over this i do think however that if this challenge does come no matter who it is they do have a real chance of taking Starmer out because if there's got to be any challenge to the ongoing pro-Israel leanings of our politicians and what the Tories are doing, he has to be up. He has to be challenged, and with the considerable upset within the party, his stubborn idiocy is causing, I do think he's got to go. I think the mood is there for him now to see him toppled by someone. So who's it going to be? Is it true? We'll have to wait and see. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share, and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Do have your say on this story in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Keir Starmer has cynically attempted to weaponize Islamophobia Awareness Month for his own ends, now as well, of course, only making matters worse for himself again, showing beyond doubt he's not going to change. He's just going to keep trying to take us all for fools. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so the French government seem to be looking at the fawning sycophancy in the UK in relation to the state of Israel and the war crimes it is committing against Gaza and thinking, well, we can be even more sycophantic than that by putting forward a proposed law to punish anyone criticising Israel and would effectively outlaw anyone daring to speak out against Zionism. You can say what you like about the French in France, insult their country up one side and down the other, and although you would be making an absolute tit of yourself, you wouldn't be breaking any laws. Do likewise about Israel, though, should this law come to pass, and you could end up fined or even imprisoned, should this end up on the statute books. This perversion of sucking up to a racist apartheid state has got to end. And where other countries are leading the way on this, with more joining them, Western countries are embarrassing themselves and their citizens in their devotion to the indefensible, their cold, callous indifference as a result, to the masses of civilian deaths we're seeing in Palestine and Israeli hands. 
This is shameless, inhumane posturing right up there with the UK proposed laws to outlaw boycott, divestment and sanctions towards Israel. Equally pathetic and just as out of touch with the public. Right, so what the French government are proposing here is totally, absolutely unreal, frankly. They're going to try and make anti-Zionism illegal. Zionism is a deeply unpleasant doctrine. We're seeing it play out now in Gaza. We've witnessed its effects for the last 75 years, though our media turn a blind eye to it over and over again, including and since the Nakba. Their right, the Jewish, or the Zionist right to an ethno nationalist state for Jewish people at the expense of the people who were already there. Little wonder that yesterday on the 106th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration that basically told Zionists they could have such land, the Foreign Office got graffitied with all manner of, well, justifiable slogans, let's call them, on what somebody thought of Balfour. But now France are going to make it illegal to speak out against Israel in effect because of course everything they do, they are doing, they say, in the name of protecting themselves and their security and their right to exist ignoring any such sense of security and right to exist for Palestinians, of course. Zionism is an inherently racist ideology. I can still say that in this country, as things stand. You might not be able to for much longer in France. So what exactly are they proposing here then, Demo? Well, the law proposition, as they call it, as what we call a bill, is to complete the penal framework on the sanctioning of anti-Zionism. So it outlines the punishments, this bit basically, that's come to light. Here's how it reads. Bill proposal to complete the penal framework sanctioning anti-Zionism Article 25 of the law of July 29th, 1881 on the freedom of the press is restated as follows. Article 25, those who, by one of the means stated in Article 23, have denied the right of the State of Israel to exist, will be punished by one year of imprisonment and a fine of 45,000 euros. An insult committed against the State of Israel by one of the means stated in this same Article 23 is punishable by two years of imprisonment and a fine of 75,000 euros. Those who, by the same means, have directly incited hatred or violence against the State of Israel will be punished by five years of imprisonment and a fine of 100,000 euros. That's all quite mad, isn't it? Massive fines and even jail for speaking or acting out against Zionism. That could extend merely to being pro-Palestinian, couldn't it? France has already tried to clamp down on protests, which only encourages the French to turn out, of course. This won't deter them at all, I fancy. Article 23, mentioned in this bill, uh, bears a little bit of explainer, it relates to how offensive words or actions can be conveyed in a supposedly illegal manner. So we're talking about things from speeches to shouts and threats made in public or via writings, prints, drawings, engravings, paintings, emblems, images or any written medium, speech or image, sold or distributed, offered for sale or exhibited in public places or meetings. So it's quite insane. It's quite mad. They seem to have covered all their bases on that though. It's made all the more insane because on the issues going on in the Middle East right now, France has flip-flopped like mad on this. Now, Doing this, where previously Emmanuel Macron had proposed France joining Israel in fighting Hamas, as if Israel aren't killing enough civilians on their own right now, to that UN Security Council resolution that I spoke about in a previous video, the one where the US vetoed it all, uh, vetoed a ceasefire, because France actually voted for that ceasefire. Yet afterwards, a spokesperson from Macron said he isn't in favour of a ceasefire. So does France actually really know what it is for and what it isn't right now in the way of foreign policy because it really doesn't seem to have one but even more mad is the fact that should this law pass because there is no similar law on french statute books not even for france itself you would be able to go to france and insult france or any other country on the planet as long as it isn't israel that can see you find or locked up that's grotesque a racist apartheid state is being elevated to a higher standard than any other nation on the planet is just being ridiculous. But whilst France and we here in the UK, our government make absolute ninnies of themselves in their infatuation and fawning acquiescence to the Netanyahu regime as bile rising up in our throats, other countries are leading on holding them to account. The latest country to expel its Israeli ambassador and recall its own from Israel has been Bahrain, joining its nearby Middle Eastern neighbours Jordan and Qatar and Yemen. And they have also severed all economic and business ties to the genocidal regime. And it's actually been the fifth country in three days to do that. And I'm sure more are going to follow suit. Though it's doubtful they'll be from the so-called free world. France is probably in the position it's in over this because it was a few years back that they actually passed a law saying anti-Zionism 
was a form of anti-Semitism, conflating the existence of an Israeli state with anti-Jewish hate, which is utterly backwards and totally wrong, but now they're going to one step further to criminalise the matter, while still being completely wrong on the issue and still insulting a great many Jewish people, many of whom will be French in their actions now. Those who are standing by Palestine, standing with Gaza and the West Bank as Israeli atrocities continue. Meanwhile, today, whilst people wail about phraseology like from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, being a racist and offensive attack on Israel's right to exist, the Israel official Twitter account in Arabic put out a now deleted tweet, because they got ratioed for it, showing Palestine completely erased from the map and just one land of Israel, complete with the caption, Israel is small in size, but mighty in determination. That'll be determination to wipe out Palestine then. Taunting the people with genocide whilst you're at it, all whilst France makes it illegal to criticise Israel's right to do that. That's where we are. Western societies are led by some very sick people. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Please do have your say on this in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, there's a video recommendation where Israel's plans for genocide and the removal of the Palestinian people have existed for at least the last six years, extolled by the then Israeli Minister for Social Equality, who just now happens to be their Minister for Intelligence. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer is still falling over himself, it appears, in his pursuit of a humanitarian pause instead of actually calling for a ceasefire, as you've been asked, what would it take for him to actually back a ceasefire? What are his red lines, even as some examples of Israeli atrocity are presented to him, and it appears that he doesn't have any, which is incredibly dangerous, an awful thing to say. This man that could be in power in the none too distant future saying to Israel, right now, they can do what they like, and he won't budge an inch on his chosen position, despite being out of kilter with not only the majority of the general public, but with the majority of his own party as more and more members and Labour groups, councillors, add their voice to the growing list of people demanding a change in tack from Keir Starmer, even to the point calls for him to resign have now been made. Could anything make him shift his stance? Well, my first thought on this was the wind's changing, but that hasn't been the case on this, as it has on so many other issues. But at least one Labour member nails exactly what it would take, and it isn't something any of us, or even Labour members, could deliver. Right, so Keir Starmer is still refusing to back a ceasefire, even as calls for him to do so continue to increase. The latest example coming from Newham Borough Council, again, Labour controlled, where more than half of the ruling Labour group and the mayor there have demanded an immediate ceasefire, diplomacy for lasting peace and freedom and justice for Gaza. They were written to Starmer saying, as Newham Labour Mayor and councillors, we are proud to represent one of the most diverse communities in the country. We are appalled and saddened by the events in the Middle East. Some of us have been personally touched by the war. Some of us will represent residents whose lives have been thrown into turmoil and chaos, or will watch on in horror. As community leaders, it is incumbent on us to demonstrate our commitment to humanity in the face of horror. We must stand with our community in the face of racism, whether that be anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. We must oppose all acts of murder and hostage taking. We stand against collective punishment and killing of vulnerable people, especially in hospitals and places of sanctuary. We call for the following actions. We join many other Labour councillors and council leaders, MPs, Labour shadow ministers, London Mayor Sadiq Khan, Sir Stephen Timms MP and others in calling for an immediate ceasefire. We join the UN Secretary General's call for an end to the blockade of medical supplies and much needed aid. We call for the release of all illegally held prisoners and hostages. We call for international and human rights laws to be upheld, particularly with regards to the illegal occupation of both Gaza and the West Bank. We call for an immediate diplomatic solution to be found through peace talks and agreement. Who can argue with that? None of us can argue with that, surely. But Starmer apparently can. Well, he's raised his head above the parapet in order to attend the North East Chamber of Commerce to talk about Labour's economic vision for the country. Totally different tack, getting away from all of this Israel mess that he's made for himself, but having invited questions at the end of his speech, inevitably his stance regarding Gaza and Israel still came up. We're at the point now that because of his ardent support for Israel, despite the atrocities they are blatantly committing on a daily basis now, obviously now, he cannot escape being questioned on his position of a humanitarian pause instead of a ceasefire, a position that basically allows aid into Gaza as long as bombing can resume straight away again afterwards. In light of this position, Starmer was asked a question following 
yet another dry as tinder speech as all of his are, but he was asked by one questioner on this situation in Gaza, what would your red lines be? There's been accusations of white phosphorus being used, of collective punishment, of bombing of safe routes. What are your red lines when it comes to Israel's behaviour? It's a good question. Put in the context that was laid before him, put him on the spot, make him criticise Israel for something. We know white phosphorus is being used. Human rights groups like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch have reported that to be true. And in addition to that, we've seen video footage all over social media of white phosphorus munitions falling from the sky and hitting the ground with Palestinians hurriedly running out with buckets of dirt and spades with which to smother the vapours, which are noxious, and the phosphorus itself, which can burn down to the bone. The stuff is illegal to use in civilian areas where it can leave people with crippling lifelong injuries. It is a blatant breach of international law that Israel are using it somewhere as densely populated as the Gaza Strip. Not that they've shown any concerns for civilians so far in their pursuit of Hamas, hitting churches, mosques, those safe routes of travel south where Israel have directed Gazans to go, of course, along with targeting the south too while they've got there. They've hit refugee camps, and as of yesterday, having targeted the entrances of a further three hospitals on top of the one they've already bombed, entrances where refugees had gathered, hundreds dead, in what can only be seen as deliberate targeting of civilians to my mind. But, back to Starmer. He had to answer this question. What would his red lines be? He said, well, I set out my position clearly on Tuesday, and what we're seeing is the worst terrorist attack on Israel since the Holocaust and a humanitarian crisis that was already in existence in Gaza, which has claimed far too many innocent lives already. We have to alleviate that. At the moment, the only practical way to do that is with humanitarian pauses. To say to a sovereign country, when 200 of its civilians are being held hostage, that they must give up their right to self-defence, is not, for me, the correct position. And anyone who has watched the images of the last two or three days have seen precisely what Hamas was saying about this. So what we have to concentrate on is the need of these innocent individuals who are caught up in this. The children, the young people, the civilians in Gaza, those in Israel who are subject to still being subject to attacks through rockets. And I have to say, humanitarian pauses to get that aid in and alleviate the situation. I think our focus should be on those who most desperately need our support and help, not on political voices in our own country. So, did you hear him mention red lines and what they'd be then? Nope. Apparently he doesn't have any. Swerved it entirely. Israel apparently can do what they like because Hamas have got 200 hostages. Or do they? Because Israel isn't really trying to rescue them very hard. Not when they are literally levelling everything in front of them. There have been reports of some of these hostages having been killed amongst the thousands of Gaza civilians who are now dead. Who don't warrant a mention from Starmer. And besides which, all these attacks, which Starmer calls self-defence... By the way, it is Israel bombing Gaza here, you Zionist shill. That's offence, not defence. You're excusing war crimes and won't draw a red line anywhere on that issue. He said this is the worst violence seen in Israel since the Holocaust, which, being the first thing he said, should have set alarm bells off that this was a guy without an actual scooby of what he was talking about, since the Holocaust was a genocide of European Jews for a start, and that it took place between 1941 and 1945, when the State of Israel wasn't actually created until 1948. He spoke of aid, and the need to get it to those who most need it. Children, social media is awash with images of kids, dead babies right now, intensely graphic stuff, which people need to see, I believe, because we are so insulated in the West against such imagery as a rule. Things are so bad out there, that we need to see these to wake up. Now that medical staff in hospitals have got a new acronym for infant patients. I don't know if you've heard about this one. Their new acronym, WCNSF, which stands for Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Given the young age of the majority of Gazans, though, having suffered decades of oppression under blockade, 50% of the population are under 18. I'm surprised they haven't had this acronym already. How awful a thought is that, though? Starmer lacks conviction. He lacks morals in his staunch belief of Israel's right to defend itself, ignoring that same right to innocent Palestinians living under occupation when Israel is literally the occupier. It's just endorsement for them to commit further war crimes. As far as he is concerned, Israel can do what it wants with impunity. As long as a US-backed plan for a pause to let them have some food before they get bombed again is permitted. That's enough to satiate what passes for Keir Starmer's soul. Not mine. As long as some aid gets in now and again, that the Gazans get a small breather periodically. 
Israel can do what it likes after. It's twisted. It's messed up. What do you call it when the bombing starts again then? As I said at the start though, there's more to it than that. We have all manner of these Labour figures, members, councillors around the country calling for a ceasefire, a cessation of the hostilities and peace talks to follow, not a breather for aid followed by more bombing. Roughly a third of his own MPs have now publicly called for a ceasefire, Labour MPs. The rest are still kissing his backside. However, one Labour MP has apparently told ITV News' Shiab Khan something that probably sums the situation up as accurately as anything right now within the Labour Party. Because they've gone to him and they've told him that there's no point Starmer trying to convince people that humanitarian pauses are the answer when he will literally be arguing for a new position as soon as Biden and Sunak announce one. And isn't that the truth of the matter? Starmer is not a leader. He is led. Led by the Israel lobby who fund him. Led by the US, just like his idol Tony Blair was. And we all saw what that led to. Imagine what he would be doing right now if he was in power. And of course the Tories and Sunak are currently saying all the same things. Because they said it before him. And Starmer has just adopted what they've said. But the moment Sunak might shift towards ceasefire, you can guarantee Starmer would as well. Not only to new to Tory criticism of him since he's riding high in the poll still, or rather Labour is, Starmer's personal polling is absolutely awful. People will still vote Labour despite him to get the Tories out. But when he just does what they say, when Labour policy continues to be dictated by the Tories and what is getting vote, what is voting Labour going to achieve then in getting the Tories out, when the Labour Party just says what the Tories are going to anyway. And what does it say about us as a society if we're prepared to vote in one pro-Israel war crimes backing excuser for another? The calls for him to go must grow. He's dangerously incapable of leading this country. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Do also have your say on this video in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, it's a video recommendation where Starmer's patheticness is unfortunately being replicated elsewhere as well, with France now pushing for legislation to make calling out Israeli apartheid illegal. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so protesting on Armistice Day for Palestinians, how dare people even think about doing that? So say the likes of Rishi Sunak and Suella Braverman, a woman who has likened such protests to hate marches already. I would have thought she would recognise one of those when she saw one, really. She goes on one every time she leaves for work, in my opinion. But various media talking heads, and of course the people they invite on to comment on such things, who are in no way impartial themselves to speak on these matters, convey the same message, hammering it home. This wrong and this deliberate reinforcement of what amounts to a proto-fascist form of messaging will sink in with those being brainwashed by it. All of these people are being deliberately ignorant of history and deliberately ignorant of the meaning of Armistice Day in their actions, though. Protesting on Armistice Day is not a hate march. It's not in bad taste either, given what is happening in Israel and Gaza. But actually, there are few other days that it could be more appropriate. Right, so Armistice Day is coming around again, the 11th of November, as it always is. Sometimes coinciding with, but not always, with Remembrance Sunday, which this year is on the 12th. But it's not just about remembering those who fought and died to save us and preserve our rights and our freedoms. This day, which marks the end of World War I, is also about that very important, very relevant word that is armistice. The dictionary definition of armistice is a formal agreement between two countries or groups at war to stop fighting for a particular time, especially to talk about possible peace. It comes from the Latin arma, meaning arms, and stitio, meaning stoppage. So the literal meaning of the word is arms stoppage. A ceasefire, then, aimed at peace. The word used to mark the day World War I ended as talks and politics and peace brought the violence to an end. Everyone right now calling for a ceasefire in the Middle East, therefore, is calling for armistice. So why is it that those of us wanting to see that ceasefire are being called haters? Are being told when we go and protest that we're marching for hate? Are being told that to march for a ceasefire, to march for an end to that atrocities happening right here and right now is disrespectful or denying Israel its right to defend itself? Rishi Sunak has issued a statement espousing this very thinking, saying... To plan protests on Armistice Day is provocative and disrespectful, and there is a clear and present risk that the Cenotaph and other war memorials could be desecrated, something that would be an affront to the British public and the values we stand for. The right to remember, in peace and dignity, those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for those freedoms must be protected. 
I have asked the Home Secretary to support the Met Police in doing everything necessary to protect the sanctity of Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday. First off, no desecration of these monuments is either being respectful or is helping the current cause if you wish to protest for peace in Gaza and Israel right now. Anyone planning to do any such thing like that is a scumbag, and I certainly don't associate myself with you. But I don't think the overwhelming majority of genuine peace protesters intend such a thing. At this time of year, the words, we remember, and lest we forget, are said often, but Sunak's speech clearly shows he doesn't remember, and he has forgotten. Because Armistice is about bringing an end to the violence he is supporting by advocating for a ceasefire and for peace instead of telling one side, the oppressive side, that he hopes they win. He'll be at the cenotaph with a poppy, with a wreath, and it'll be a vision of hypocrisy, as it will with Starmer doing likewise alongside him. Sunak talks of those who gave their lives for our freedoms, yet he is telling us that expressing those freedoms, our freedom of speech, our freedom of expression, would be disrespectful on that day. But any other day would be more suitable. But again, that misses the point of armistice. It flies in the face of the literal meaning of that word. He brought up the Home Secretary, so let's deal with her. So Ella Braverman tweeted out in support of Sunak's statement, saying, I agree with the Prime Minister. It is entirely unacceptable to desecrate Armistice Day with a hate march through London. If it goes ahead, there is an obvious risk of serious public disorder, violence and damage, as well as giving offence to millions of decent British people. I have full confidence in the Metropolitan Police to ensure public safety and take all factors into account as they have done in similar situations in the past. She talks of desecration, entirely the opposite to what armistice means. She talks of hate marches when people are marching in solidarity with the oppressed people of Gaza, being bombed indiscriminately, so many children dead, in showing solidarity with them, wanting an armistice for them. And she's calling that a desecration and demonstrating hate. Braverman is married to a Zionist Jew, so perhaps her sentiment isn't too surprising, but I doubt it would make any difference in her case, married or not, such as her hard ring, hard right thinking. She's precisely the sort of person people are protesting against, the politicians who should be calling for peace, but instead back Israel to do what they like. No red lines, no calling out of war crimes, no upholding of international law. All things our fathers or our grandfathers and so on and so forth fought and died for to protect. The sort of people they fought are the ones being protected by those who govern us now or would like to. And I don't say that lightly. In so many ways, when you hear and see what is happening and you know who is committing it, are we really still at a point with a state born out of creating a land for those who were the victims before and are behaving not dissimilarly now to a people they see as less than them who they refer to as animals? It might be in the worst taste imaginable that I say that for some, but for me there is no more appropriate time to make that point. We cannot be against what happened before. We cannot remember. We cannot be all lest we forget if we're making exceptions. The atrocities of both world wars are things I can only relate to in history books or documentaries. I wasn't around. I can only imagine what the horrors were like. But equally, I'm witnessing horrors in the Middle East on my screen, on the video, in graphic detail, here and now, through social media, and it makes me weep. Little kids being blown to bits and marching against that, being against that, wanting that to stop, protesting and demonstrating and wanting to see a proper, meaningful armistice. And we're told we're advocating hate and marching for hate. How sick a society are we that we're led by people telling us that? Do we stand against what we're seeing or do we back it by going along with what our politicians are demanding of us and what our media keep reinforcing? And how do they reinforce it? Well, they bring on people to interview who are on the side of Israel, as things stand at this moment in time, as matters concern now. And as things stand in the here and now, as if they are representative of national views, when polling actually shows they aren't. And actually, this generates more anger among the populace. Vehemently Zionist former Labour MP Louise Elman got wheeled out just to hammer this point home. Initially asked to comment on the outspokenness of left Labour MP Andy MacDonald, who has been suspended by Keir Starmer for saying the from the river to the sea Palestinian freedom creed, which incidentally he didn't say. But she moved on from that to completely backing the sentiments of Sunak and Braverman. She said, It's not just about Andy, it's about the numerous rallies taking place, the hatred that emanates from them, the calls about changing things from the river to the sea. The Jewish community knows what that means. There were huge numbers of Jews protesting, Louise, but you're as hardline pro-Israel as they come. You'd give Starmer a run for his money on that score. It is a narrative that is being hammered home again and again and again. That protesting for peace is not what we're doing here and not just here but around the world a narrative that protest is bad is something that should be condemned and that calls for peace 
at a time when we remember peace finally coming at the end of a war, as well as remembering those who fought at that time and lost their lives for our freedoms so we can protest. It's something that should be condemned. If that is what people believe, then we might as well forget Armistice Day entirely, because as a society, we no longer remember and we will have forgotten. Our political leaders are completely wrong and we need to have the courage to say it and the courage to take our support elsewhere so we have better leaders going forwards because war crimes are being committed. Collective punishment is being meted out here and now and we're seeing it happen and we're expected to say we remember and lest we forget when we're ignoring what those words mean in light of what is happening in the world right now as we're living and breathing through it. How dare anyone say we can't march for armistice or call for armistice in light of that. When on Armistice Day, of all days, that is more relevant than at any other time of year. We should be caring more, not less. If our UK leaders want us to be counted to silence on that, then we shouldn't be. Be respectful. Of course, that shouldn't need to be said. But be, for humanity's sake, heard. Because if international law and human rights become optional, we're all going to be affected by that at some point down the line. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Please do have your say on this in the comments below and be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation for driving Palestinians out onto the desert. Very much seems to be Israel's plan as leaders the world over fail to hold them accountable. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.